Did you know that your kidneys maintain your blood at the right pH? They, the kidneys do so many things. So we've already talked about that they filter out waste. They also maintain acid-base balance. They do this by secreting hydrogen ions. So you're going to urinate out hydrogen ions and you're going to reabsorb bicarbonate. Hydrogen is acid, bicarbonate is alkaline. This whole process begins to get impaired at a GFR of 40 to 50. So that is very early on, like stage 3A or worse. So very early on in the process of kidney disease, this acid-base balance can get out of whack. So we really need to get on top of it quick. Okay. Pre-dialysis, what are you going to do about an acidotic state? You're just going to eat a plant-based diet. And if if a dietitian looks at your labs, she'll look at your bicarbonate level. And if your bicarbonate level is not where we want it to be, then we can do something as simple as just giving you a teaspoon of baking soda in water. And now we get you back into an alkaline state. Very simple. Dialysis is a little bit harder because the kidneys have completely failed. Um, so there is bicarbonate, like let's say in, um, we'll do hemodialysis. They put bicarbonate through the machine. As your blood's going through the machine, they're putting bicarbonate in there, right? Um, but what I always tell dialysis patients is this, help the dialysis machine. Don't just do whatever and then expect the dialysis machine to take care of everything. Help it. So if you ate a more alkaline diet, now you're helping that dialysis machine keep your bicarbonate in the place that we want it to be. Why do we even care? Okay. If you are in a more acid state, um, your muscles can waste. You'll lose muscle protein. Your muscles will waste. Destruction of bone and bone disease. We already know kidney patients are at risk for bone disease. We don't want that. Decreased albumin synthesis. What we just talked about in that study, your liver won't make enough albumin. Increased rate of progression of chronic kidney disease. We don't want you to progress. We don't want you going to the dialysis chair. We want you to stay away from that dialysis chair. Stimulation of inflammation, which we're going to talk about inflammation, and impaired insulin secretion and responsiveness, which is really bad for um, people with diabetes. We don't want, we want you to be very insulin sensitive. Okay, so how do you know? You're saying, okay, well, then how do I know if my diet is al acid or alkaline? Well, there's an easy way to know. There's something called potential renal acid load, PRAL. What this is telling us is if I have a food, when I take it into my body, does it produce an acid state or an alkaline state? It doesn't matter what the food is outside the body. So if you take a lemon outside the body, right, it's acid. But when you put it inside the body, it's alkaline. So we have to look at the potential renal acid load to know what the food's going to do inside the body. And so here we go, potential renal acid load of certain foods. You want this to be a low number. You don't want the food to produce an acid load. So you want a low potential renal acid load. Look at fruits and vegetables. They have a negative number. Milk and product, milk and whey products, a plus product. But look at all the animal protein, a very high number. So what that's telling you is you need to eat plant protein, not animal protein, to have an, an alkaline state in your body. Okay, pre-ESRD, pre-dialysis, does lowering acid slow progression? Yes, why? Because protein, particularly animal protein, is the principal source of acid generation. Eating an acid forming diet creates, increases certain hormones. So when your body is acidotic, it's gonna increase certain hormones like angiotensin II, aldosterone, endothelin. These hormones are the ones, remember I told you about that the doctors many times will say, I'm just going to give you an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker and send you on your way. Those drugs work on these hormones, trying to keep these hormones, stopping them from doing what they should be doing. So if you eat an acid forming diet, you are bolstering these, these hormones. Um, Short term, these hormones will help excrete acid, but long term, they're going to worsen kidney function. Okay, now let's talk about you, dialysis patient in particular. Acidosis, same thing. Increased catabolism, decreasing muscle mass. It makes your bone mineral metabolism worse. It's going to cause calcium to go from inside the bone to outside the bone. It's going to increase your parathyroid hormone, which you don't want. You want a normal parathyroid hormone. It's going to alter the inotropic state of the heart. What does that mean? It just, it's the contract, how your heart contracts. 
You don't want that altered unless a doctor specifically gives you a medicine to alter that because you have a problem, but you don't want to be altering that because of your diet or because you're in an acid state. Um, it triggers mechanisms underlying malnutrition, inflammation, atherosclerosis. This is called the uremic phenotype. And it's basically, it's just this phenomenon that we see in dialysis patients where these three things go together, the malnutrition, the inflammation, and the heart disease. It's just like this one big cyclical mess. Acidosis is going to increase that and it increases morbidity and mortality. So one thing um, that we really want to ask with dialysis patients is, is dialysis bicarbonate adequate? So this varies because it depends on where you dialyze. Theoretically, Bicarbonate should be an individualized prescription. However, the reality is it's on the loop, meaning that every patient gets the same. And again, it depends on where you dialyze. It even depends on what country you dialyze in. Um, but also, you know, the, the question about, well, maybe we just give more bicarb, but the research hasn't been very clear on that. And in fact, um, the adoption of this this practice, it still demands more conclusive studies because if you put someone in metabolic alkalosis, so you send them the other way from acidosis to alkalosis, that's also dangerous. So um, there is an argument for home therapies and I love home therapies. If you're an in-center hemodialysis patient and never considered home therapies, think about it because it's more individualized to you. Um, but there's also an argument for diet, like eating an alkaline diet which is the most natural way. Um, but for now, I'm just going to tell you again, help the dialysis machine eat on the more alkaline state so that the dialysis machine doesn't have to do all the work. All right. Inflammation. What do you need to know? So we've gone through protein. We've gone through acid-base balance. Now what you need to know is inflammation. Um, we've already talked a little bit about this. Um, what is inflammation? So if you think about, if I cut an apple and it turns brown, that is a picture of inflammation. It's oxidation. That brown is oxidizing. Rust is also oxidizing. If I take a lemon and I squeeze it on that apple, that browning stops. Okay, the same thing happens inside our bodies. We have oxidants, which is this middle free radical. You can call them a free radical or an oxidant. It's the middle guy here, okay? And they are, they're not complete. They're missing an electron. And so they begin that browning or rusting process inside of us, unless we do something about it. So if you have an oxidant, what you want is an antioxidant. You want to stop this process. So the antioxidant is the friendly guy that has an extra electron. He comes along and gives it to the oxidant and stops this process. If you don't stop the process, then the oxidant will keep stealing from other healthy atoms. And then now that one's an oxidant. So it steals and, it, and the process goes along to where it'll eventually damage DNA. This is the beginning of cancer and things such as that. You need to, you need antioxidants. You have to eat antioxidants. Um, also your body can make antioxidants, but you have to eat certain things for your body to make antioxidants. So let's talk about that a little bit. If you have that process going on that I just showed you pre-dialysis, um, as kidney damage worsens, so does inflammation and oxidative stress. A lot of this has to do with those toxins again. Your kidneys aren't filtering them out. Your body is building up toxins and it's becoming inflamed because it's trying to fight those toxins. This can cause premature aging and kidney fibrosis. That's scarring. So it's just scarring your kidneys and we do not want that. Inflammation contributes to malnutrition, coronary artery calcification. So, or, or like damage, what, what that means is that you're laying down calcium in your arteries and veins, and eventually that can become blocked and you can have a heart attack. Endothelial damage is that lining, that inner lining of your arteries and veins. You want to protect that. If you're in inflamed state, you're going to damage that, which leads to atherosclerosis. Um, it can lead to insulin resistance, anemia, bone disease, and ultimately progression of kidney disease, which we certainly don't want. All right, now let's talk about dialysis. Inflammation in dialysis. Inflammation is a strong prognosticator of sudden death in patients with end-stage renal disease. So it's something that we need to address. 
I've been talking about this now for a few years, like, hey, we're not addressing this. If we know that it's an indicator of sudden death and we're trying to keep people alive on dialysis, then we need to address inflammation. Um, the phenomenon of inflammation persists and remains an unaddressed target, uh, unaddressed need and um, therapeutic agent. So I am going to address it. What contributes to inflammation in dialysis? Okay. Pre-dialysis, we talked about is a lot of those toxins. Dialysis, the dialysis membrane in and of itself, um, if you are on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, you're using your own peritoneal cavity. So that's more natural, but this is a foreign body. If you start dialysis with the central venous catheter, which is in the middle picture, you see there's a catheter there and it, this catheter goes down and it, it's inside the heart, inside the body. The problem with this, what, why do we even have this? If you're late stage kidney disease and you don't act ahead of time to get a permanent access in your arm, that's called a fistula. And let's say you crash into the ER because all of a sudden you're holding fluid and you can't breathe and your kidneys have failed. We have to dialyze you now. And the only way to do that is to put in the central venous catheter, which is very dangerous and very inflammatory certain medications. Um, and then there are certain middle and large molecules and protein bound molecules, which I'm going to talk to you about what that means. So when you go to dialysis, your the dialysis machine removes toxins or certain molecules. If it is a small molecule, if it's a small toxin like urea, creatinine, no problem, removes it just fine. If it is a middle molecule, it does not remove it. So when we talk about inflammation, when your body is in a state of inflammation, it produces certain things like called cytokines. And all cytokines do is tell your body, we need more inflammatory cells. The dialysis machine will not remove these. And then there's protein bound molecules. These come from the gut, which we're going to talk about when we talk about the gut kidney axis. We don't think the dialysis machine removes these, but they are also kidney toxins. Okay. So we've got to, again, let's help the dialysis machine. If it doesn't remove inflammatory markers well, then let's keep our body from being inflamed as best as we can. If it doesn't remove protein bound molecules that our gut creates, then let's eat foods to where our gut won't create those things. How are you going to know if you're inflamed? So we talked about what inflammation is. Um, how are you going to know? Well, there's certain things you can look at. Every month, if you're in dialysis, you get a lab report, right? And on there, it has albumin, hemoglobin, transferrin, and ferritin. Transferrin and ferritin may not be on there, but I bet your albumin and hemoglobin are. And you can ask for the others. There's also a research lab, but we're you're never going to get that. Um, but we will talk a little bit about it. But if you're looking at your dialysis lab, when you get your lab report, if your albumin is low and your hemoglobin is low, then you need to ask for these other two numbers because you could be inflamed. Um, why is that? Because remember, we said if you're inflamed, your liver is going to say, I'm sorry, I can't produce albumin anymore because I have to produce these other inflammatory proteins, right? So your albumin is going to go low. If you're inflamed, your body is going to manage iron in a different way. Your body doesn't want a lot of iron floating around if you're inflamed because iron feeds inflammation, one. And two, the body wants to store up iron because it feels like it's in a crisis state. So if you're inflamed, that stored up iron is represented by ferritin, the bottom number here. That's going to go high because your body's hanging on to it. <music>